when you're dealing with samples on a daily basis, you will at some point inevitably uh, have some kind of samples you've never seen before um, and that are so rare that no one has ever, you know, put the work in writing an extractor, unpacker, whatever. Um, one, like, certain type of that is, like, launches, wrappers, installers, converters that create PE files out of something else um, that use some kind of options where you need to extract those and you don't know how. Here is one way you could approach this um, based on something I did for a customer sample. So uh, in this case, exit for J. So let's check it out. Right, so one of the things that's rarely talked about in any uh, malware analysis tutorials. It's like often you're not analyzing malware, you're actually getting files from customers and they want to know if the file is malicious or something else. And something, uh, sometimes the files they send in are not complete and cannot run. So how do you obtain information, as much as possible information, so you can tell the customer um, what else you need from them. Um, like this is the case with this sample here. Um, this is not a customer sample, just to be sure. Uh, I just I just searched a similar one on VirusTotal because the files on VirusTotal are public anyway. So yeah, but let's assume this is a customer file I got. And um, when I execute this, it tells me, oh no, the Java VM could not be found on your system. And here I looked uh, at this environment variable called exe4j Java home. Um, if you search for exe4j, it's a, well, I did that and I installed the program. So it's kind of a wizard for um, creating of PE files out of Java applications. So, okay, of course, the first thing I did to potentially solve this problem is I um, defined an, a path variable called exe4j Java home um, environment variable. And I put the JRE, the Java runtime environment into the path. I put it into the exe4j Java home um, I put it into Java Home. I installed several versions of uh, the Java runtime and still the file would not run. And as it turns out, this is actually a misleading error message. This file, as it is right now, um, cannot run. So, yeah. Exe4j is uh, actually something you would have to buy but um, you can um, get a test version of that. And this tremendously helped here in, you know, getting to, more, getting to know more about this file. If you check this wizard for creating the um, PE file out of a jar, um, you will see one thing. There's like project type and there's a regular mode and there's a jar in exe mode. So, Basically, what you can do is you can create a launcher that does not have an embedded jar. It just points to a jar file that's like outside of it. Um, and if that that's missing, it cannot run. That would be regular mode. If you use jar in exe mode, um, it will search in the Java class path. That's like an option that's given later. Okay. Let me just fill this in. What's the short name of your app? All right. And let's just do the desktop as our distribution. So, okay. Executable name. Um, 
Now, these are like options you can already see. Now, and here is something that's called class path. So you can say, okay, please scan environment variables or scan a directory or whatever. And then you point it to, in this case, music directory. Okay, so it will look in this uh, directory for the actual jar file that it should execute and in that jar file it will search or it will execute the main um, class that you give here like main class of my app okay um, okay you tell it a version number just put anything in there and now we can compile an executable and it appears here. So, all right. So what this sample does, now I wanted to find out more about this sample. And one thing that I noticed is, uh, let's create an image of it. Uh, so if you check the visualization, um, one thing you would notice is like there's most most of it doesn't seem like there's place for any jar I I mean if there was an archive it would look a bit differently um, for example let's take Podix analyzer and create an output of Podix analyzer because that's a Java archive right so um, That's Podix Analyzer. And here you can see that's what a Java archive looks like. You have uh, this mess, um, this like with mess with some dots inside. And then in the end, there are some more, more ASCII strings, which is blue in the byte byte plot. Um, that's what a ja Java archive looks like. And it's, it's actually just a um, zip archive with a Java class files inside and a manifest. So compare this to, to this and there's really no location where you would say, okay, this is probably a Java archive in here. Of course it could be kind of encrypted, but if it was encrypted, it was, would also show um, as being high in entropy, which is not the case. Um, there, it does not seem like there's anything packed inside this file, just based from the from the entropy and by plot image. Um, now, we could see like there's this, this overlay. A lot of the times when you have launchers, installers, uh, similar things, the overlay is the interesting thing to look at because a lot of them will put information into the overlay. Um, the overlay is just appended data. So let's check this um, in the sample. So you say go to and put the overlay here. And that's where we arrive at. So, and yeah, there's some kind of information in here. You see that there's some mumbo jumbo about like log files, log file names, uh, some jars are mentioned, and here's uh, here are environment variables. So, but they have also some kind of encoding before them. Like you see, um, this is like this belongs to XF4J. So what I did because of course I could guess what these mean, but I want to be sure. Um, I used the wizard and I created a test file like this one. And then I just switched some of the parameters, like um, let's say we change this to, we uncheck this one. So, and then we, um, need to change the name. So it's the second one, say finished, compile a new one. So now like we have two test files. The first one 
will have like our default and the uh, second one will have like just one tiny change. And then you can compare those um, with something like vbindiv. That's a, uh, why I, I, you will see vbindiv and we say, no. Executable name <laughs> two. So vbindiv will, if you press enter, you will go to the first um, bytes that are different when comparing these files. And you see, well, firstly, um, th there are these bytes. So they may have to do with the option, but it's kind of a lot for just changing one flag in the file. And then you see this byte. So that looks more like a flag, right? Because there's one and there's zero. So apparently they encoded it as a string instead of uh, using byte values. But the only thing we checked or changed was um, allow VM path through parameters, right? So this is where we find those. Uh, second thing, um, we also see our inputs into these programs. Like this is the short name of your app. So we know this is the short name of our application that we told this program to put, put into the configuration. So um, that's where we find this, of course. And um, here is a the class path, right? We told it to use music search music for additional jar files and, uh, and then look in these jar files for main class of my app. So again, we know um, like where, where this is located, but now we need to find like kind of patterns inside this. Um, and what happens if we change things? So this is, you will notice that this is not zero terminated, these strings, like immediately after short name of your app, there's like another character. So it somehow has to know where the end of this, um, where the end of this is. So if we open our test file here, okay. We can directly search for short name to get to the area. Um, like this has a length of 12 in hex. Um, so where do you see 12? You see it here. Um, that is our, that's a D word and that's directly in front of um, the this one. That will say how long the value is. So also we noted, um, for instance, this is the one that says, okay, VM pass through parameters are allowed or are not allowed. So that's the one here. So what's in front of that? It's just one because it's like the, the um, entry is literally just one byte and so that's like the first clue we can get. And then things I also notice, and that's especially in comparison with our sample. Um, here is like this error log. Then there starts the next entry, but this is apparently not, not some kind of uh, length because it would be too long. Um, here's another entry. And what you may notice is like, here's another zero. So this is like another flag probably. And then there's 69, like in front of this flag, we have the, the size, which is one because the flag is just one byte. And there's the 68. And after the 68, you know, there's this entry with the flag and then there's 69. And then there's another length. So we have always the same pattern of like, this is some kind of ID here, 68, 69, and so on, then zero A, 
no, that's the length. Um, this is some kind of ID and yeah, 6a is the next. After the ID follows the length of the um, option or setting and after that the actual entry value. So it's always the same. So what I did is created a configuration extractor that just looks for these IDs, which I found by, you know, for each setting that is in uh, the Exa4j wizard, I just created a new variant of the file and then uh, I could compare what uh, setting changed and then I knew okay this um, VM pass through parameters have like 7d if you compare this here um, they have 7d allow VM pass through parameters um, there are some more like certain things that are a little bit more special like the class path you have several options to add and you can say it's an archive it's a directory whatever um, again, like this is the same principle. You just change one thing and then you will see, okay, they have this encoded here because this S means scan directory or D means directory or R A means archive and so on. So, um, so this is how I created a configuration extractor based on, wow, that info. And I found out, let's just execute it on our file. Yes, I want to quit. I don't want to save it. Thanks. Uh, if I put this, uh, apply this configurator on my sample, um, I get the important information. Firstly, we know there's no uh, jar file inside this. So this is just launcher. It's just uh, the file that executes files, other files. And what files it executes, that's inside this configuration. So here we know that's the class path. These files are relevant. These files um, are the ones they look for um, to find this main class, PT, DG, CI, text clients. So it's some kind of text, text program from 2015, it seems, uh, written in Java. And it applies those parameters to start the VM. So, and then you know, okay, um, if there was a splash screen, which doesn't seem to be set here, uh, you, you, could also uh, check the splash screen image in the with resource hacker or something. But yeah, and that's a program name here. Um, uh, yeah, I noticed, you know, the one uh, program that, one program, the, there was this uh, value at the beginning that, um, you know, that changed with every, built so every time i built a new file this one here was completely different so i tried okay what if i built the same configuration again and then it appeared that this was the same so it's not not some kind of timestamp um it's actually some kind of checksum because if the configuration file is the same it will produce the same the same numbers so this seems to be just some checksum. So you can compare and say, okay, this is uh, this has not been tampered with afterwards. And you can immediately say, okay, this is the same configuration. Um, yeah, so what I could do with this information. It's, it's Essentially, I could tell the customer, okay, this file is just a launcher and uh, whether that is part of something malicious depends on these files and you find them here. So 
you know, you can say, okay, please look for the file plastic one, two, zero jar. And then we will check those if they are malicious. Um, so yeah, I think this should be a, you know, talked about more because a lot of times what you deal with in your daily work as malware analyst is you have corrupt files, you have like things that look like garbage, you have log files. Um, and this is something I do not see much talked about how to deal with those and like when to say a file is clean. Um, when do you stop looking if there's something malicious in it? Um, I think I might do more videos about that. So, but yeah, I hope this gave you some insight on how to work with, you know, launcher generators. You can also use the same if you have some kind of builder. If you have a builder for anything really to uh, see how it affects the created files. So yeah, and that's it for today. Thanks for watching and uh, leave a like. See you next time.